good afternoon. It's a pleasure being here with you in the first Innovation Science and Technology Forum of the Year in person. Um, and I can say that since I arrived in Canada, the Zoo Canada Chamber of Commerce has been a key partner in opening doors, in guiding my first steps to develop my network as a newcomer here in Canada, and as well as many other partners like Miriam Lazarchi that is here from Lanzari Startups that really embraced my business. It was something completely uh, crucial to make the first steps here. And nowadays I guide international entrepreneurs to apply for a Canadian business incubator and expand their business. And I know how important these events and to develop the partnerships, learning and sharing experiences are crucial for their success. So innovation and collaboration come together when we are open for dialogue. Canada is the second highest innovation ecosystem in the world. It's a country that welcomes newcomers and international businesses and offers support to startups and scale globally. Besides, uh, it's, high, it's a high international, it's, uh, besides the Canada high uh, international reputation, Canada has 14 free trade agreements opening doors for more than 1.5 billion consumers in more than 51 countries. Now, Brazil is the largest country in Latin America with, the, with more than 214 million people in the top seven largest consumers market. So Canada and Brazil can create even more synergy, collaborating and bringing innovation to find solutions for global challenges. The two countries have multicultural environments and innovate, innovative entrepreneurs that can change our future. So focus in Canada International Innovation Program, Neurotechnology Partnerships, and the bilateral startup sector, today's event will bring successful cases and IST trends to both countries. Before we start, I want to mention our key partners that make this event possible and also support our chamber initiatives. So our platinum sponsor, Valley, our gold sponsor, EDC, our silver sponsors, Brookfield, GMX, Cisco Mario, 4B Mining Corp, VMA, Advogados, Landing Mining, our key partner, the Global Affairs and Canadian Train Commissioner Service, um, and the Bronze event sponsor KPMG that's hosting us here in this great area for the event. Uh, and also our event sponsor, uh, Prima IP in Mela Hawk Logistics. That is um, here with, in the name of Hayley Hawk Institute. So thank you so much. So we have great partners and speakers today, and you have also a moment for Q&A session. So uh, prepare your questions, be succinct, I know it's not easy, but ask questions that are very precise because you have like a short time, but we really want to enjoy and have the best time together today. So our first speaker that we are going to invite today is um, Leonardo Coelho de Souza. That is an honor our Deputy Council General of Brazil in Toronto to speak for us. It's a pleasure being with you here today, Leonardo. Please join us. Pleasure is mine. Dear members of the BCCIST Forum and distinguished special guests, ladies and gentlemen, let me first transmit the best regards from the Consul General of Brazil in Toronto, Ms. Vanja Nobrega, who is in Brazil at the moment and unfortunately could not attend this event today. I would like to thank the Brazil-Canada Chamber of Commerce for organizing this meeting and for the honorable invitation to the Consulate General of Brazil to take part in this initiative. There are approximately 90,000 Brazilian citizens living in the jurisdiction of the Consulate General of Brazil in Toronto, which includes 
the provinces of Ontario and Manitoba and the territory of Nunavut. And these figures grow at an impressive rate. According to Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada statistics, uh, 11,425 Brazilian nationals became permanent residents in Canada in 2021, an increase of 116% in comparison to 2019. Brazil became the seventh country that most exported permanent residents to Canada last year. I would also like to mention the extraordinary numbers of the bilateral trade Brazil-Canada, which achieved the impressive figure of almost 8 billion US dollars in 2021, with exports from Brazil to Canada of 6 billion US dollars and Brazilian imports from Canada of almost 2 billion US dollars. Brazil is the 11th exporting country to Canada. These statistics, together with the presence of a growing hard-working Brazilian community in this country, are proof of the dynamism of Brazil-Canada relations and source of inspiration to the work of the Consulate of Brazil in Toronto. Besides the impressive figures of our consular and trade promotion sections, science and technology and innovation, is also an important aspect of the work of the Consulate General of Brazil in Toronto. In 2022, Brazil and Canada are celebrating the 12th anniversary of the Science, Technology and Innovation Agreement. The agreement includes the establishment of a joint committee to promote bilateral science, technology and innovation collaboration between Canadian and Brazilian partners from industry, academia, and government. This joint committee, which had its fifth meeting in 2021, has been tasked with developing and implementing a, a Canada-Brazil Science and Technology Action Plan focused on innovation designed to accelerate the commercialization of research in promises areas such as ocean technology, life sciences, information and communication technology, clean energy, green technologies, and nanotechnology. I believe the BCCIST forum could be seen as one of the various offsprings of the Brazil-Canada Science, Technology and Innovation Agreement and its joint committee. Here we also have experts from both countries, from private and public sectors and universities, actually discussing projects and initiatives in these fields. The Consulate General of Brazil in Toronto, together with the Embassy of Brazil in Ottawa and our consulates in Montreal and Vancouver, work in coordination in order to foster and implement IST bilateral projects under the umbrella of the Science, Technology and Innovation Agreement. The Science, Technology and Innovation sector of the Consulate is guided by two general principles. A, the urgent need for Brazil to diversify its exports, improve and develop its productive base, base and optimize the use of its good human and infrastructure resources in scientific research and B, Canada's recognized position in the Global Innovation uh, Index. It was the 16th place in 2021, with significant availability of capital and investments in technologies and startups companies. The seventh edition of the BCCIST Forum has a focus on Canada International Innovation Program, nanotechnology, partnerships, and the bilateral startup sector. I'm very excited to hear and learn about the successful cases, updates, and discussions around IST in both countries that will be brought about here today. I do believe that Canada and Brazil are well positioned to come up with world-class products and solutions to meet the needs of the two countries. Both of them can work together to mutually benefit socially and commercially and drive the economic development of the world. 
I'm convinced that the BCC IST Forum can have an important role in this process. Thank you very much for your attention and wish, wishing a very fruitful and successful session today. Thank you very much, Leonardo. It's impressive how many Brazilians have come into Canada. My God, it's a lot of work for the Brazil Chamber of Commerce, the incubators, and you can really connect more and create more collaboration. So thank you so much for joining us today. So nanotechnology panel, uh, the first one to talk is uh, this amazing professor that was highly recommended for his work in Canada and in Brazil. Leonardo Simon, he's professor from Waterloo University, and he was sharing all his working with startups, with uh, research and uh, diverse, uh, diverse environments. And please, Leonardo, join us. Thank you so much for coming. for the invitation. Uh, it's a privilege for me to be here. Uh, it was a last minute uh, decision, but I, I think uh, uh, it was the right one. Um, I had, uh, uh, this is the end of the academic term at the university, so uh, lots of demands from the students. <laughs> um, uh, my name is Leonardo Simon. Uh, I am, I am uh, from Brazil. I uh, did my uh, engineering degree in the south of Brazil and also my uh, grad graduate studies and I immigrated to Canada in 1999. So I've been here for quite a few winters now. <laughs> and I became an avid uh, ice fishing, <laughs> <laughs> which I like to enjoy every winter on Lake Nipsing. Um, um, it's my first time attending the event from the IST at the Chamber of Commerce, and uh, we always need to understand who the audience is. So it was about innovation and the technology and startups, and then all the research projects that we do at the university, they come to our mind at the same time. Uh, and what are we going to talk about? Um, and then I talked with some of my uh, 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 co-workers at the university, and we decided to present the university and present the scene for the startups instead of presenting my own research here. So that's what you're going to hear from me. So in the next slides, you're going to hear about the University of Waterloo uh, and what we do in terms of nanotechnology as a, as a, as a leader in this area. And uh, I will conclude my presentation by uh, talking about a startup company that is very active in my laboratory at this moment in the area of uh, nanotechnology and sustainability. Um, this uh, image or the building on the left is uh, the chemical engineering building known as E6. If you ever visit the campus, and the one on the right is the Mike and Ophelia Lazaridis uh, Quantum Nano Center. Um, uh, along with these two buildings, uh, many other buildings were built uh, in the last uh, 15 years. Uh, when the university uh, received the call from the province to increase its size and its diversity. So when I joined Waterloo, the Faculty of Engineering had 3,000 students. Today we have over 7,000, making it one of the largest faculty of engineering in North America. We have the largest in Canada. To give you the sheer perspective, we graduate about 1,200 engineers every year, between 12 and 1,400 engineers in 14 different uh, disciplines of engineering. Um, the building on the left, uh, we like to brag about, was the most expensive research building in Canada when completed. It was over $160 million. Um, and that's because of the uh, specifics that it has to uh, allow researchers like me to do the nanotechnology research. So a first slide is about the university. And uh, there's a lot of bragging in this slide, uh, and I think uh, most of it is true. 
<laughs> it's considered the number one in this category that you have here. It's the most innovative university in Canada. This is a very difficult metric to support. Very difficult when uh, we don't have a specific numbers. But when we have an aggregate of indicators, Waterloo remains at the top for many years. And um, there are other great institutions that remain there, University of Toronto, University of British Columbia, and we are very proud to be measured at the same level. Um, um, another one that we like here is that we have uh, an excessive amount of startups, uh, things that sprout out of the nothing. Our undergraduate students, uh, they have this uh, uh, talent. And we keep asking ourselves why there's so many startups coming up in Waterloo. And we have some, uh, we have some theories, but we're too short to share with you the reason for that. I want to share with you three numbers. Uh, $247 million uh, in research funding uh, from private partners. That's not government money. Uh, in 2019, the cycle 1920. That means companies are putting their money at the University of Waterloo to do research. Uh, the second is 20% of our research funding comes from industry. And third, although a small number, is a great step. Professor uh, Donald Strickland received the first Nobel Prize for the University of Waterloo in 2018, and we are very proud of her achievement. Okay, now I'm going to narrow down from the university to nanotechnology. And nanotechnology has many facets, many aspects. Uh, the one that I'm going to share first is the Waterloo Institute for Nanotechnology. The logo is on the right, which we like to call WIN. Uh, this uh, can be seen as a virtual institute because it doesn't have a single laboratory. Instead, it's composed by 100 or so faculty members, individuals like me, who put their name on the list and have a laboratory which are very active in doing research. And here on the previous slide, the one on the right is where I have my office and one of my research laboratories. This building, the Nano Center, hosts 27 faculty members. So it's entirely dedicated to nanotechnology. So you can do the math and see that about 70 other faculty members are in other departments, biology, uh, physics, uh, systems design engineering, pharmacy. So it's a very broad scope that we cover in nanotechnology. Um, this makes it the largest institute of nanotechnology in Canada and among the largest in the world. Uh, both by its size, the number of faculty members, the number of square feet in laboratories and technology, and also in research output. How many startup companies come out of that? How many patents? are filed every year, and how much research publications we have. Uh, in total, this, uh, say, this 11, uh, this 100 faculty members would attract, for the area of nanotechnology, around $20 million a year in research funding for nanotechnology. Okay. Next. Uh, the institute uh, started uh, in around 2012, 2015, so it's just over, uh, just about 10 years old. The building uh, started in 2012, and the institute was already running. So this institute is not very old. And throughout the years, we have reorganized the thematic areas, areas that we like to be seen for. And nowadays, we have four areas, the smart and functional materials, these are uh, carbon nanotubes, graphene, quantum dots. This is the synthesis and the manufacturing of uh, feedstock for other industries. Then we have connected devices, like vehicles communicating with each other. Uh, then we have uh, next generation of energy systems, clean energy, uh, like capacitors, batteries for electric vehicles, solar cells. And then here we have uh, therapeutics and uh, ther Theranostics, which deal with the diagnostics in hospitals. Um, uh, I couldn't uh, uh, be fair to my colleagues if I were to explain what they do, so I encourage, if you want to hear more about it, to look at the website, uh, nano.urlu.ca, 
and you can always reach out to our uh, executive director, Professor Sushanta Mitra, which would be more than glad to guide the company or members of the Chamber of Commerce on the expertise that is available on companies that are there. They have a business development officer as well, uh, this, our institute. Uh, for nanotechnology education, uh, we have an undergraduate engineering program that graduates engineers with a degree in nanotechnology engineering. This was quite a challenge when, uh, when we did this first time. It's the first one, it's the first degree of its kind in Canada. It started in 2005. And um, uh, it was one of my first jobs when I arrived at the university to work on committees to create courses for this program. Uh, has been quite a ride. I teach these students in third year uh, polymer course uh, during the spring term. We have about 120 students in this class. Um, all of our engineering programs in Waterloo are cooperative education. It means that the students, they have to, in addition to the academic, the work, the work uh, academic terms, the courses, they will have to work outside the, the classroom. So the model goes that they work four months, they, four months of classes and four months of work, four months of classes and four months of work. So in just under four years, which is four months, four years and eight months, they will have completed two years of work experience, starting from year one and ending in year four. It means that when I'm teaching them on third year, they have already completed, most of them, more than a year of work experience as a, as a trainee in engineering. So they see the world where they will be working at before they graduate. We believe that this is a significant, uh, uh, a significant element in creating the entrepreneurship in Waterloo. Because very early on, these engineering students already know what uh, the opportunities are, the problems that the industry are facing. Okay, so startup creation might be a consequence of this uh, uh, co-op program. That's one of the things. Uh, we also have, at the graduate level, a collaborative graduate program in the area of financial technology. This word collaborative means that different graduate programs, for example, chemical engineering and pharmacy, they will work together in the area of nanotechnology, supervising graduate students in the interdisciplinary areas. So we have seven departments. Uh, now shifting into Waterloo entrepreneurship ecosystem. Um, in addition, to, uh, in addition to all these uh, efforts in the Faculty of Engineering, the university has uh, this um, um, incubator called Velocity. Uh, Velocity started as a residence where students would, uh, would uh, have a mentorship in the same place where they would sleep and get their meals in the morning, uh, in the dorm. So this, to be admitted to the university dormitory called Velocity, they need to make a pitch and the pitch had to be accepted for their startup. And they would be admitted in this dormitory with an initial grant. So this is, this is a, one of the, 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 the principle of Velocity, is an incubator where the student lives. This started in 2008. Shortly after that, they run out of space. There were more students they, they could accommodate. And they also needed to do things that were not allowed to do in the dormitories. They need laboratories. They need the oscilloscopes, they need the fume hoods for different types of, uh, uh, for the different needs they, their company has, so their companies that they're creating have. So the university partnered with the city of uh, Kitchener and Waterloo, and the space was uh, created in, in the downtown area, and other spaces are available. The Velocity Garage, in two stages here, expanding today, uh, 37 square feet, 1,000 square feet with 120 companies. And we also have Velocity Science, which is a laboratory where they can do experiments and create new materials. <clears throat> what is the impact of this entrepreneurship in our community? Why are we doing this? Um, these numbers are not from the university, it's from an economic study, a report. It's believed that 170 million uh, to 
Canadian GDP in 2018-19 was created due to startup companies. Uh, they have reached the revenue of uh, over uh, startups related to Waterloo have reached the revenue over 2.3 billion. And I'm going to read this quote: "The technologies and innovation spurred by university spin-off companies provide job opportunities and help to advance the standards of living in all for all Canadians." Um, like our council mentioned, uh, Brazil has a strong need into new technology, and I think Canada is a great partner in, in, uh, to foster its uh, principles of it. Uh, economy based on new knowledge and innovation. Um, it was in another slide that I had here, but I believe uh, there are three companies, startup companies nowadays in Waterloo, that have reached the uh, designation of a unicorn, which is when they have raised over a billion dollars. So the university is very proud of that. Okay, uh, this is the most difficult slide, and then the penultimate slide. <laughs> Uh, which uh, it tries to summarize the relationship that the university could have with the startup or the venture creation. And in this slide, I started putting this together 12 years ago when the first technology in my laboratory was commercialized in Canada. It was commercialized by a number of companies and was uh, something that could go into a vehicle. So it was manufactured to go into a vehicle that was assembled in Oakville. So people looked at me and asked, well, how did it happen? It's not common for this to happen. So I started thinking, and I created this slide to explain what is innovation. So for a startup, we might start with an idea or with a market demand and how we create, how we connect those two. So the model that we have here is that in academia, we will deal with ideas. We might have inventions, which is, the, which is create, creation of a patent. And we might have the publications, which are the research papers. But that, in my opinion, is not enough to be called innovation. Innovation is when we use products that benefit our life, improve our economy, and lead to prosperity. So to me, this is the ultimate word. word how the knowledge can be translated into prosperity to have for everyone. So, when we go back here, the ideas and the work that we are doing at the university side is, can be called technology push. We get new knowledge and we try to push that into the market. Whereas on the other side, we have market needs, where we say this is a market pool. Things that we want but we don't have yet. Cars that have low emissions is an example of uh, market pool. Plastics that don't contaminate the environment is another example of market pool. And in this walk, and sometimes the entrepreneurs <laughs> will, will have a period that is called the value of death, which is when they have the idea, they have the patent, but they don't have the product ready for the market yet. And it's called the value of death because that's where most startups will die. They run out of funds, they run out of resources, and they can never deliver what they promised to the market. So we don't connect that. Okay, my last slide here to conclude, uh, I wanted to uh, use Tango, Tango Green Canada as an example of how a startup can benefit by collaborating with the university and how the university benefits by working with a startup company. Uh, Tango uh, started sponsoring research in my laboratory in 2019 and by the time we had finished all the agreements and got their first samples, the pandemic hit. <laughs> and then we had to enter that stage of the laboratories are closed, it's very difficult, you can't go with the university. But eventually, in the end of 20, early 2021, the rules were relaxed and we could start doing the work. As a result of that, this year, uh, Tango uh, incorporated in, uh, in Communitech, which is an incubator in Waterloo, uh, they are uh, in, uh, increased their contribution in my laboratory uh, by almost 10 times, leveraging their contribution with my tax. And as a result, we were able to support several graduate students and researchers working on the project. Uh, they, uh, they also filed their first provisional patent as a result of this research. And now they're undergoing efforts to 
to scale up part of their technology. So what is their technology? Uh, they are looking for ways of uh, uh, benefiting from uh, industrial hemp. When we talk about industrial hemp, we ask ourselves, is this the same as cannabis? No. Industrial hemp and cannabis are very different. And in some countries, industrial hemp is very developed, like China is the largest producer of industrial hemp, whereas cannabis is not tolerated. In other countries, like Canada, the legislation allows to both, and there are many farmers in Canada planting industrial hemp. And most of them plant for food. You might find hemp seeds being sold in uh, superfoods or other ingredients in, at uh, grocery stores like Costco and so on. And what is the reason for that? That's the main market for industrial hemp today. I'd like to answer the question with two, two things. One, it contains some um, oil, essential oils that don't exist easily in other plants, like omega-3 and omega-6. So it's in, it, it's in individual in, ingredient that is very rich in hemp. And second, I think it's most important, hemp is a crop that the farmers will call cash crop. So it can be rotated where farmers are doing soybean or corn. So every farmer that plants soybean, there's a, num a limiting number of years that can be harvested. And then they have to rotate, otherwise they, they would exhaust the soil. So they rotate corn, soybean, corn, soybean. Eventually they can add hemp as a source of food where they'll sell the food. So Tango Green Canada is using the lab to over from producing food. So it's not competing with food to produce fiber. And then in the laboratory, transforming that into nanocellulose. And that goes into the area of nanotechnology that we like to call functional materials. We get this nanocellulose and we make nanopaper. Nanopaper is a type of paper that is made 100% of cellulose, but it's transparent. When we look at it, we can look through the paper because it's so thin. And this has applications in, uh, uh, in, uh, in monitor screens, in uh, uh, solar cells, capacitors, so for energy applications. The other market that they're looking at is to use the same nanocellulose for biodegradable plastics. So we have environmentally friendly packaging. After we have our meal and we put that packaging or a coffee cup, it can be recycled. So that goes in align with the United Nations sustainability goals that they have listed here. Smart cities, uh, energy efficiency, and so on. Uh, with this, I conclude my presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you again. Thank you so much, Fernando. I was listening to you and I was um, doing a comparison with mining because nanotechnology has so many applications. We can like see many of many fields and, and mining sometimes you don't have the knowledge that we wouldn't be here and using all this technology if there was no mining. So it's uh, so interesting how broad and important nanotechnology is in our lives and how important it is for research and bringing innovation and, and bringing all these students and startups. I've been in Velocity with Julian, uh, and it's impressive how huge it is and how incredible the energy is with all that innovative entrepreneurs creating so many new opportunities to make our future better. So thank you so much for the presentation. And um, our next uh, um, invitation is from Monica. Monica is a professor at Unicamp and she's gonna be joining us from there. So she's in Sao Paulo, and she's gonna talk from, from Sao Paulo. It's a, a live for us. So Jim is gonna help me just to put her on stage. I want to know how did you find the Waterloo University to join and start your journey mm -hmm. uh, doing this research? Because I think it's so interesting for the entrepreneurs that are coming, for example, from Brazil, and how they can find a way to join a special place like uh, the, uh, the, the research and all this cluster that yeah. is involved, right? Okay. So, my first time in Canada, I have been living here for 30 years ago in Toronto. And I'm from Brazil, I'm from Sao Paulo, Brazil. And then I enjoy a lot that time in Toronto. And I, and when I returned to Brazil, um, I started to 
work in the other company, Plasky and Science, and stay in contact with the university. So I was teacher in Brazil as well, and then I made some contact with you, uh, and then after many years, I come back here in Canada, and I make my post-graduation in the University of Waterloo mm -hmm. with Professor Sam. So after that, uh, when I conclude my post-graduation there, we will start the company. That is the company, in fact, is starting in the US, and then we, we have that idea, and then we bring this idea from Canada. And then I have the other co-work, Edson, with me, and then Edson bring this idea for us, and we discuss, and we start this company. Yeah, yeah. It ha when was it? Was it 2000? Uh, it's in 2019. 2019? So yes. it's quite recent. Yeah, it's quite recent. Wow. But the company with uh, the startup is, uh, is beginning in the US and then we bring to Canada. So tell me, one thing that was challenging for you and one thing that really helped you to be in the cluster in Waterloo that really guided, one thing that is a very important strength and one challenge that you could share with us. Yeah, I think it's a, a big challenge for in this, uh, in this field. It's people understand that we use, uh, we're not competitive with the food. That is a, a big challenge. Uh, that is, a, it's important. Everyone knows we use a waste of, we call for now waste, but uh, we try to become a value in this waste. So there is, we have the seeds, we have the, the food from the hand, and we use exactly that for now what the farm didn't use. That is our big challenge for people to understand this one. Mm -hmm. the, uh, no, and if you uh, think another about, thing yeah. is in some country, for example, if we discuss, uh, we have a, a lot of Brazilian here, uh, when we discuss what is the difference about the hemp and cannabis. So it's a, I think it's a big challenge in Brazil as well. So there is a, a big difference for that. You know? um, especially because in Brazil we can explore much, much more about the, the hemp and our agriculture there. So, can support more about this idea of the hand is completely different than cannabis. Perfect. And what would be a, a huge strength connecting with a cluster like in Waterloo with all this research, technology, startups? Yeah. I think uh, Neil explained very well about the, what the University of Waterloo it uh, means in Canada in the world. How is the contribution for the university for, um, for Canada, for the world, and especially in nanotechnology. And now uh, our research is uh, a full involvement in nanotechnology. So that is the point that we decide. And again, my co-work at Malaysia has a, a big participation for that because I, that time in 2019, uh, I'm a post-graduation uh, alumina there. Mm -hmm. I know very well, but it's a big important for we explain and the investor understand how it's important. It's the department and the research at the University of Oregon. What is represent for them? Excellent, Thomas. Thank you so much. Leonardo, it's coming my back pleasure. to you. Yeah, can I ask questions? Of course, yeah. Peter. So, uh, Leonardo, why did you choose them? Why did you say yes? yes? Oh, that's your question. Yes. <laughs> I'll shut up now. So, yes, to, uh, like, what was about their proposal that was um, really I think the, uh, there, was, uh, there was an easy marriage because uh, I, I have done work with sustainable materials in my laboratory um, in nanomaterials. For, uh, I started into, as a faculty member, I started in 2002 with nanomaterials, and in 2004, uh, I started collaboration with University of Well and University of Toronto, nanocellulose, uh, natural materials, 
for uh, application in packaging, automotive, molding. And uh, in 2004, going back, uh, there was a professor, which is now retired, my good friend, Professor Larry Erickson, at the University of Guelph. At uh, one time visiting his laboratory, he showed me a stock of hemp, just a piece of the hemp, a dry hemp, and he said, it took me three years to plant and harvest this hemp here in the University of Guelph because RCMP didn't want me to do this and they had the coordinates in the GPS of the location where these plants are being harvested. And so hemp, uh, hemp, it was a forgotten crop because of the legislation scenario. So I had worked with many other crops, corn, soybean, straws, wood, uh, many, many companies. And when uh, Douglas came to me and said that he had done his master's with me working with wood fiber from uh, Eucalyptus, was actually a partnership with a Brazilian company called Suzano Open Paper. And uh, he said, I think we want to start a project with hemp. And he said, let's do it, let's do it. So it was, it was, it was natural. Wonderful, Renato. Uh, and if you think about the uh, case of Douglas, with all the Brazilians that are coming, these 90,000 probably some of the amazing entrepreneurs that are among them, uh, how they can really craft and what are you looking for uh, in collaboration? What are the profile of these entrepreneurs that can go to your lab and work together? Um, what are the trends now? Now, if I narrow down to answer the question, what is the profile of successful entrepreneur? A uh, successful entrepreneur, we have a few of them who came out of Waterloo and they taught those students. <laughs> so, um, some of those elements, is like being a PhD student, uh, you should not be afraid of failing. Uh, when a student, at first I'm going to explain what, what means being a PhD student, because the students ask, should they do grad studies? And they say, if you're going to do a PhD, you have to accept that you're going to work for eight months and you're going to have only negative results. Everything is going to be bad, nothing is going to work. And eventually you're going to get into the laboratory and you're going to get that result working. And in three weeks you have a paper being published because you're working on a very difficult problem. So an interpreter is trying to develop a new technology or a new venture and the relationship that I do I would ask, let's do business together. Let's have a hot dog stand. That's a venture. But it's a venture using knowledge that already exists. But it, when you start creating a venture, being inside a, a company that, a large company like Exxon or Braskian, to create a venture, engineers are going to go through many stages of evaluation. So they have a, a safety net, the companies around them. But as a startup, you're trying to create a venture that does not have that safety net. And at the same time, you have unknowns, more unknowns, uncertainties. So uh, the person has to be sure-footed in its idea, he has to understand what the market wants, and has to be uh, say self-motivated and understand what the market wants. I think these are the, the two uh, attributes that uh, would make an entrepreneur fail really quick. Okay. Excellent. And then I agree with you. You don't have to be afraid of failure. Yeah. That's probably one of the things that we can be sure that risks and problems are going to happen to yeah. you, but to be resilient to receive that result. Yeah. Uh, I think the challenge is uh, how, for how long can we, uh, we can afford to be making those mistakes? And at what point we need to ask for help? And at what point the government uh, of different, the government can step in and help through different programs. Uh, uh, I think for uh, intra uh, and entrepreneurs to be close to universities is very beneficial because there are so many resources at universities. They're not free, but they're a lot cheaper than you would uh, uh, pay. It costs a lot more if you try to get them on your, on your own laboratory. And uh, they're all at the same place. In, a, in addition, I'm selling my product now. <laughs> <laughs> in addition, you can train the new talent for what the company needs. So uh, Edson is often talking with the students in the laboratory, and uh, Edson has over 30 years of experience in pulp and paper and uh, quality of manufacturing fibers in large scale. 
we go there and I talk with these students and we start challenging these students at a very, a very early level to invoke the student thinking about uh, the fundamentals of engineering, math, physics. And then I ask uh, uh, Edson, the seasoned engineer, to go there and talk with those students. And the students will be prepared with the fundamentals and also understand what the market needs. So what's happening here is that the startup is training the competitive employees for the new venture that is being created. That's what we think is the advantage. Excellent. Thank you so much. It was great. This opportunity why we were Thank so with us. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So again, I'm really glad for the invitation. This is not something I usually do, you know, talking to, to this uh, nice audience that we have here. And I appreciate the invitation to be here. I think my connection to Canada can, comes, uh, I'm a member of the International Scientific Advisory Board for the Waterloo Institute of Nanotechnology. But I uh, have to be honest and say that I'll talk about a little bit about innovation here, but I don't have any specifics regarding Canada, so I apologize for that. Okay, so uh, about the nanotechnology in Brazil, uh, as I mentioned, I'm a professor at the University of Campinas. I'm a physicist. Uh, I, actually, I'm the, the current director of the institute. And I'm also president of the Brazilian Materials Research Society. That's why I'm, I'm not in Sao Paulo, but I'm, not, I'm in Boston now. Uh, for the Material Research Society meeting, so that's why we have this class, <laughs> this confusion. Uh, and maybe I'll, I'll be focused a little bit more on examples I have on materials because of that, okay? But I, I, I hope I can give you an overview of what we do in Brazil in Nanotech. Okay, so uh, to give you an overview of the nanotechnology research in Brazil, uh, I refer to a study made by some uh, Dutch researchers that are collaborators in our, our bioenergy program. Uh, this is from 2019, so the data is a bit older than that. But you can see here that the, this plot shows the number of publications, scientific publications in nanotechnology from Brazilian researchers. And as in the whole world, it's been growing over the years. But it's mainly done in three fields, in three areas of knowledge, physics, chemistry, and material science. Of course, all over pharmacology, chemical engineering, and so on. But because of the way the, the scientific environment in Brazil is, is uh, set up, we have mainly efforts in physics, chemistry, and, and material science. Uh, so when you look at the, the scientific papers, we can see that most of, most of them you know, related to nanotech research and innovation are carried out in universities, right? So most of, most of the research in Brazil is funded by public money and is made in, in, in universities. Uh, if you look at the patents, however, we can see that although the universities are still in the top uh, in the list, there are still some institutes, federal institutes, like the uh, Nuclear Energy Commission, which holds a series of, of institutions, research institutions, the uh, technological research in, in Sao Paulo State, and uh, the, of course the oil company, and the Braskane, which are companies really. Braskane is a chemical company, a large chemical company in Brazil, it starts to appear in the red. But still, most of the what we do in nanotechnology is carried out in universities. So if you look at the uh, patents that were uh, uh, filed in this period, we can see that most of them are connected to biotechnology, but mainly pharmaceuticals and cosmetics. I didn't know that until I read the paper, you know, how much cosmetics we have in Brazil. Actually, we have the largest cosmetic company in the world. Uh, the number of patents, though, is not large. So there is it's still not a huge effort to make the patents in Brazil. Nevertheless, uh, something that is happening in the last few years, and I, I like to stress out, is related to energy. You know, the whole world is craving for energy sources, new energy sources. And Brazil is an example of that because it has the cleanest energetic matrix in the world, or one of the cleanest. It's 81% of the energy, our electricity is from renewable sources, and among them, of course, we have a lot of hydropower, you know, the largest uh, power electrics in, uh, in Brazil, like Itaipu, 50% of, of the our electricity comes from hydroelectrics, but we also have wind power and solar photovoltaics coming along very uh, strongly, 
And basically, in this case, we have Focal Day, the one of the largest uh, organic photovoltaic based companies in the world, System Brazil, which now changed name. And <coughs> I'm sorry. In <coughs> solar photovoltaic, there's something that we it's important in nano. For example, if you look at the <coughs> Uh, the, the photovoltaic capacity has increased 50 percent in the last year in Brazil, and one of the large companies that are on it is already doing perovskite uh, uh, cells. So perovskite is a material that's being uh, there's a lot of work in the last few years. It's a stable material, so it usually used in form of nanocrystals. Also, there's been a lot of investment in green nan green hydrogen and uh, uh, the economy in Brazil is now tracking. There's a large investment in one large plant in, uh, I think it's in Bahia, I don't recall the, the place, but I think it's in Bahia. And also for doing green hydrogen, we use them crystals as catalysts. So there's a lot of this material science uh, which we develop in universities that is pouring into the companies and mostly Brazilian companies. Okay, but uh, I don't want to spend too much time because Kalu as me to be sure. Uh, what I want to point out a similar case. Since Felipe Bellucci is here, I won't talk about any federal investment, but I just uh, point out Sao Paulo State as a similar case. Sao Paulo has the, large, uh, the oldest and most important found, uh, uh, research funding agency in the country uh, among the states, right? Not federal money. So this resulted in a very large ecosystem for research in the state. And here you see, this is a map of Brazil, and you can see Sao Paulo State here. So these uh, little dots that you see are universities and research institutes in Sao Paulo. Remember, the top three uh, universities in number of scientific papers were from Sao Paulo, you know, University of Sao Paulo, University of Campinas, and UNESP. Uh, we also have the, the National Center for Research and Energy Materials, which is uh, federal funded, but it's uh, just one mile across. <laughs> the University of Campinas, and there we have the Nanotechnology Center, and we also have in Sao Paulo, in several places in Sao Paulo, the uh, sites of Embrapa. Embrapa is an, uh, a, uh, let's say a federal company, but it's there are a lot of places in Sao Paulo that works, and the National Nanotechnology Lab applied to the agro business is in Sao Paulo State. So, uh, so the, as I told you, the lab, National Nanotechnology National Laboratory is within the Center for Research in Materials and Energy, and is a has partnerships with the whole university and an old, whole research system in Brazil. Also, part of Cibra Tech that I, I believe Felipe will talk about about. And as I mentioned, energy is an issue, right? So we have a lot of issue, uh, the energy from renewable sources. This is a bit old, so the, uh, the plot I showed you before is that. But Sao Paulo also values that. That's why we have a PG program by energy that branches, branches among the three universities and has connections particularly with the Netherlands, Delft, and so on. We also have uh, uh, initiatives that are sponsored by companies like Shell, who founded with PAPES, uh, the Center for Innovation on New Energies. And this is a really important because it has focal points. It's a 10 year old you know, program. So it, they, you know you have a sustainable, sustainable environment for this research to, to happen during five to 10 years. And this is really good in terms of planning what you're going to do. But it also has a focus on that, that effect because it's related to, for example, advanced energy storage, which is heavily based on other materials. Uh, something I'd like to point out is this effort to accelerate science innovation in Brazil, particularly in Sao Paulo. For example, for PESP, IBM and University of Sao Paulo have now started the activities for this huge artificial intelligence center, which also focuses in agribusiness, natural languages, soil gas exploration, digital agriculture. So this is not exactly technolo nanotechnology, but it also involves nanotechnology in the midst of the activities. Uh, I also, I don't have the data, but I was talking to the president of the University of Campinas last week, and he mentioned that some, in Sao Paulo now is the only state in Brazil where research in the companies is already talking with the universities. So you have already enough research in companies, in private companies, uh, to, you know, uh, that 
take fighting with the universities. And this is really nice because that's something that usually doesn't happen in countries like Brazil. Okay, so I just uh, want to be, again, I want to be brief. I'll just give you some examples of some of the companies that we have now in Nanotech. One of them is Nanox. Uh, this is a company that was uh, basically came out of the University of the Campus in San Carlos of the University of Sao Paulo. It um, benefit from FAPES funding for small companies. It get, gives funding like we don't have venture capitalists, so FAPES makes something out of it. And then it works on basically nanoparticles for uh, all kinds of applications, but one of them basically because of COVID-19 is on under, under microbial surface control, like super nanoparticles of flying several materials that we use on a daily life. You have like so far five international patents and they are present in 13 countries and it's a 15 year old company already. So it's well established. So this is a, usually the example we have uh, longest living example we have for this kind of uh, startup that turning into a uh, 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 nice company. And also we have, for example, this concern about green nanotechnology. So we have, for example, Nanogreen, which is a small company trying to provide metal nanoparticles, but using green chemistry or in green uh, methods. Uh, we have, for example, Nanovetoris, which is a large group, is also benefiting from federal funding. I think Felipe might, might tell about it. Uh, they work with encapsulating of nanomaterials. So if you want to bring materials, even if it's for, for your skin or in the soil, sometimes you need to make a capsule out of it, and this capsule sometimes is in the micro and nanoscale. So none of the bodies is something that works in both uh, health, nutrition, cosmetic applications. So this is some, uh, also a company that's present in 22 countries. And there are very young startups like Triltech, uh, and uh, it's pointed out as a possible unicorn. And I can tell you, I don't know if you've ever heard about the, I don't know how to translate it, dark uh, Indian land in Amazon. So if you look at, if you look at the Amazon region, uh, you have a very, very thin soil. It's not really good for, for, for farms or crops. But in certain regions, which are related to places where the indigenous population would have been and they burned soil, they have a very rich soil, which is very dark. And it has been studied for a lot of people. And this, I just took this picture from a paper that shows uh, corn growing on normal soil and growing on this dark uh, uh, soil from the Amazon. So you see that the yield is much better. So what they, the group that has done, and this is a, a, a professor from the University of Brasilia who worked with Embrapa, our you know, agriculture business company, they worked on carrying carbon nanoparticles as nanoparticles for plants, they're taking the nutrients and using less pesticides and toxicity, so they have a large yield in all kinds of crops. Uh, even soybean under hydrogen stress, which is, you know, soybean takes a lot of water for, for, for to develop, so they even tested on a hydrogen stress and did work. So this is something that's probably, you know, be uh, a bit impressive. That's why it's pointed out as a possible unicorn. Uh, we also have other kinds of nanomaterials. I don't want to be long here, just two other examples. For example, in uh, ceramic powders, we have a huge investment in some cars about uh, large ceramics groups who have made a lot of patents and, and developments. Uh, Nanox came out of this group, and also now nanotechnology is coming out on ceramic powders at nanometric uh, nanoscale to make security inks, to make magnetic dispersion, in particularly for banking applications. The last example uh, that I want to bring, I don't know if you ever heard about graphene. Graphene is one of the most important developments in, uh, uh, in material science and physics because it's a 2D material, it's a one single sheet of graphite. If you take graphite and exfoliate it, you get graphene. It has a lot of nice properties. So it has been studied, the Nobel Prize a couple of years ago was uh, attributed to the, the, the guys who discovered graphene. So Minas Gerais is a state of Brazil and it's called, well, Minas Gerais in, in translation should be general mining because they have all kinds of metals 
And as you can see here, a lot of different <laughs> materials can be mined there. But it's also the third largest producer of graphite in the world and has the second uh, uh, largest reserve. So what they did is that they pull a lot of companies, some Brazilian, some are international, uh, who are interested in graphene. The easiest way to do graphene is just take a natural chunk of graphite and exfoliate. You can take a, a scratch tape, glue it, and you get a piece of graphene on the scratch tape. So they are uh, connected to, they created this Gerdo. Gerdo is a large company in Brazil for, for mining and for, for all kinds of business. And there is now Gerdo Graphene and started the activities last year. And so they are working to use graphene among several technologies that we have now that will be improved with the addition of this, uh, making this composite. And to find, just to make the final slide here, uh, I think the, the direction Brazil is taking, and I hope with the new government we can actually pursue that, is going towards sustainability and the environment. So Brazil has the cleanest Brazilian, uh, 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 the cleanest energetic matrix, but it also burns a lot of biomass, particularly in the Amazon now, and that you know, <coughs> does not compensate for, <laughs> does compensate all the good we do. The, the, with, the, with our matrix. So something that we could do is use our Brazilian diversity. And one example I bring you is from Natura. Natura, as I, I find out, is, one, is the largest company, cosmetic company in the world. It has several brands, so we don't know Natura as much. But they have a particular line of, of cosmetics that's called Echos. And that relates to the diversity in the Amazon region. What they do, they support about 300 communities of fishermen in the Amazon. So they bring up the seeds and what up they know about the popular knowledge on how these plants work. And Natura extracts whatever component is important for them and makes a line of products. So Natura has a partnership in our technology with APT, which is an institute in Sao Paulo, and is part of the EVP project that Felipe will probably talk to you about. But this is something I believe, my, uh, not me, but a lot of people in Brazil believe this is where we should go. And I just finished my last slide showing, this is a Natura plant in the south of Brazil, and this is the organic possible tech uh, uh, solar cell collection that they have on the roof, and it was made by a Brazilian company. Okay, so uh, I just leave it here, and I hope I entertain you with a bit of what we do in our technology in Brazil. Thanks again for the invitation. Thank you so much, Monica. many applications and so how, how much we can collaborate Canada and Brazil with so many opportunities that we have been developing here and in Brazil. So thank you very much for joining us. If you can stay a little bit more, uh, of course Philippe is going to talk now, but afterwards if you have questions you will be uh, ready to answer. So thank you very much. Can you help me here? Felipe is the Vice Director of uh, Applied Technologies of the Ministry of Science, Technology and Innovation of Brazil. Felipe, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much for your invitation. Can you see my screen and can you, can you hear me well? Yes, we can see your screen and can hear you very well. Thank you so much, Felipe. Nice. So thank you very much, Brazil, Brazil, Canada, Chamber of Commerce. It's a great pleasure to be, to be here today, talking in this forum, presenting a little bit more about what Brazil is doing in terms of advanced materials and nanotechnology. Especially today, uh, I'm talking about budget policies, as I mentioned. I'm Felipe Perusi, I'm Vice Director of Applied Technology in Brazil at the Secretariat of Entrepreneurship and Innovation at the Brazilian Ministry of Science, Technology, Technology and Innovation. So, if you can see the name, the name of our Secretariat, it's possible to see uh, the perspective that we have to nanotechnology and advanced materials. So, we understand that in Brazil we have maturity to think about entrepreneurship and innovation 
uh, in terms of, of nanotechnology and as well as contributors. Here I have a list of our history in terms of nanotechnology and as well as contributors. Of course, I'm not, I will not read all these points to you, but I would like to share my, 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 presentation, my presentation to everybody, so feel free to look for information about our bio spot. This is a view of our uh, ecosystem in terms of science and technology to advanced materials and, and nanotechnology. Here we have the main topics that we are uh, working on in Brazil. So we are interested in developing our normative and governance for, for advanced materials and nanotechnology. We, we would like to increase our, our human capital, strengthen our strategic the strategic programs. We would like to update our infrastructure and of course to expand it. And we are looking for funding to, to, to our programs and to our research. And we are investing a lot in entrepreneurship and innovation. Innovation for us is the interaction between the research institutes and the companies. And we are working in some points of dissemination. We understand that this is a strong and necessary point. For example, here in Brazil, uh, if you ask someone about the importance of technology, so it's nice that everybody understands the importance of nanotechnology, but 90% of the Brazilian population is not, is not able to identify a Brazilian scientist. Because of this, we, we, as a ministry, we, work, we are working a lot in order to disseminate our science and our, tech, and our technology. So, in terms of nanotechnology, this is our most important umbrella, our, our most important normative, that is the Brazilian Initiative on Nanotechnology. So, here we can find uh, the most important points for us. We have another important normative that we looked at, especially in the last year, that is the Advanced Material Science, Technology and Innovation Policy that was looked by our president. So this emphasized the importance of this topic for our government. And here uh, we had a national plan for this stock that was established by this, by, by this policy and we have a management committee uh, with representatives from a lot of ministries in our, in, our, in our capital. So this management committee for advanced materials is composed by our ministry and representatives from the defense ministry, uh, economy ministry, agriculture ministry, health, mines and energy, Environment and representatives from the academia. So this is an important, an important committee to discuss the directions of our policy in terms of advanced materials and nanotechnology. We will not check recently another important program that is the Graphene Innovation Program, as mentioned by Professor Monica. Graphene is one of the most important material to us, and we will we, we are working a lot in order to exploit this opportunity. We have at least one decade of science and technology on this topic, and now we are trying to transform this knowledge and new products, new, new services, and new companies. Talking about programs, CISNAN is our most important program in terms of nanotechnology. So, CISNAN is, is the Brazilian system of laboratories in nanotechnology. We have here 20 three of the most uh, important laboratories that work with nanotechnology in Brazil. This is the second phase of the, this program. This program started in 2013, and uh, this is the second phase. Here we have the 23 laboratories uh, in the bio by regions in Brazil. So Unica, of course, is here with us. Here we have the list of the laboratories, so if you want to contact one of them, feel free. It's possible to find the, the, the coordinators in the homepage of these laboratories. And if you are a company and you, and you would like to 
develops and if we our language, we can access this program that is named as Simbra Tech Nano, that is the nanotechnology innovation centers. Uh, these centers are dedicated to stimulate, to articulate, and to finance joint projects between co companies, micro, small, and medium, and large companies with laboratories from the system. So here it's possible to uh, obtain financing for, for joint projects and in terms of maturity the, the minimum of this, this, this project is uh, the GRL4. Here we have the distribution of these laboratories around our country and divided by, uh, divided by the center. Uh, another important initiative that we have here in Brazil to put together research institutes and companies is the Engrafi, that is the Brazilian company for industrial research and innovation. And the idea of this, this, this institute is put, is put together six, seven, six, seven, six Engrafi units with companies and share the technological risk of the companies. So in this case, the states share about one third of the investments, the uh, institutes the other one third, and the company the last one third of the investments. Nowadays we have more than 1,000, 1,800 projects supported and more than 2.6 billion uh, reals invested in these projects. It's very interesting to see that uh, more than one half percent of uh, one half percent of this, 50 percent of this, this, this budget is invested by the companies. And uh, in terms of, uh, uh, only to mention, in number of you have 19, 19 projects, and the amount is 21 million, and in nanotechnology we have nowadays 53 projects that involves about 61 million uh, reals. We have a uh, NCTI, Engrafi Network for Innovation in Graphene. So here we have 16 Engrafi units that work with Graphene, and we put all these, these units together in order to, to uh, work uh, in bigger projects. And very interesting program too. We have uh, the Brazilian developed one of our most important program is the INCT. The National Institutes of Science and Technology. Here we have the most important universities uh, working together in around specific topics, such as nanotechnology. Here it's possible to see uh, 10 National Institutes of Science and Technology that work in nanotechnology here in Brazil. It's easy to find all these, these ICTs on the internet, only, only using their names it's possible to find more information about them. We are investing a lot of enforcement in terms of dissemination of information, so it's possible to find uh, the videos about our main, most important programs on, on the internet, especially in the NCTI YouTube channel, so feel free to take a look at these videos. We are investing a lot in startups, as mentioned, as mentioned by Professor Monica Chu. So, if you want to find our most important programs in terms of federal government, it's possible to find uh, by startup point platform. So, there it's possible to find our programs, such as the uh, technology based entrepreneurship program, named at Centella. We have more than 10,000 ideas there, and about 5% is related to nanotechnology. We are launching a lot of uh, public calls to support uh, startups too, such as this call that we launched recently. Now we are investing in, we started investing in 30 startups, and now the second phase we have this. Sorry, these 10 startups receiving financing by the government on this program, but we have other programs dedicated to supporting startups, such as Inet Startup. And in terms of infrastructure, we implemented a national research platform 
there it's possible to find our most important information related to scientific and technological uh, infrastructure. So if you are looking for an equipment or uh, a facility, it's only to access this platform. Here we have a picture about our uh, a little bit about our ecosystem. So we have had mentioned Professor Monica De Silvius that that is a single provider source, and we we build in, in this moment a biosafe level four laboratory, a cobalt in a light beam, and this facility we're going to be the unique in the world. Uh, we are implementing some facilities some facilities in Brazil nowadays, such as the technological hub for cancer materials and strategic minerals, named Dragon Bear. Uh, this laboratory is implementing in, in Belo Horizonte, so uh, including in the next week, we are launching the operational phase of this project. We are implementing another center uh, in the Research and Technological Institute in Sao Paulo, that is the, the Acronyms is IT. Uh, this project is a joint project with Air Tower team, and the idea here is to develop new new technologies using Crack Team. We, we are working a lot in looking for a new investment for our for our research, and we created a platform uh, named Invest NCG. MCGI, where science, technology, and innovation connect with uh, investment. So here it's possible to find in English uh, more than 2,200 projects uh, supported by, by our ministry that, and then the projects that are open to receive investment. So I would like to invite everybody to visit this platform. And we, we are working a lot in order to Stimulates, stimulates new new investments from the private sector. And our most important mechanism is the uh, innovation law. Uh, based on this innovation law, we received about uh, in reals invest. Uh, this represent about twenty. 20, uh, between 20 and 25 percent of all the Brazilian investment on science and technology, and we are implementing new mechanisms such as uh, investment in equity funds, incentive by the bankers, and equity funds and endowment funds, funds in, in Brazil. This is new. We launched it recently in order to. Uh, in order to make available for our ecosystem other instruments to invest in science and technology. So here we have my contact. Feel free to, to contact, uh, contact us here in Brazil. Thank you very much once again for the opportunity. And our ministry is open to collaborate, is open to disseminate information. And I hope that, that this is in the first step for a, 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 very, a very fruitful cooperation. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, we have uh, two minutes for our break, so I would like to open for questions if everyone, everyone someone would like to ask questions for Felipe or uh, for Monica or for Leonardo. Uh, that's the moment. Someone would like to ask any question? I have one, Felipe. I have one question for you. Um, you said that there are opportunities for investments. Are also opportunities for Canadian investors to 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 collaborate somehow? Yes, for sure, for sure. Uh, we have a very, a very diverse ecosystem here in Brazil, so we understand that investment from other countries from the private sector are very welcome to in, in our ecosystem. And for example, if you want to invest in in innovate, innovation centers, so you have three or four that are prepared to this. If you want to invest in Brazilian startups, uh, we have a lot of uh, startups here that 
that's under that under scoop they burn us off receiving best demands from uh, the private sector not only, not only from the uh, from the public service so this is a point that we are stimulating a lot uh, of course we are learning learning a lot uh, from this ecosystem ecosystem we understand that uh, it's a little bit different when you compare with public funding funding but uh, we understand that this 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 financing when arrived in a center or in a startup brings more than only money brings a lot of uh, uh, intelligence and opportunities because of this we are stimulating a lot this kind of approximation so if you want to have a list a list of centers a list of startups that are available to receive investments thank you Philippe. thank you so much uh, and monica i would like to ask you a question uh, how can we uh, collaborate and uh, bring together canada and brazil regarding the work you have been doing uh, in brazil and i know you are collaborating also sometimes with a uh, waterloo region well, uh, cycling research is a bit more particular, right? Uh, first of all, there's some synergy between, there are a lot of synergy between the areas. Uh, Lean has a lot of areas that are heavily, there are, there are lots of researchers in Brazil that have common goals as the Water Institute of Land Technology, which is the only institution I, I know um, a bit more in, in Canada. But I think the, the, the easiest way would be through partnerships uh, through the funding agencies. For example, I refer to FAPES because I know Felipe would cover more the, the federal investment, but FAPES has specific programs for mobility, exchange students, and so on between uh, any institute, research institute in Brazil, not only universities, and uh, you know other institutes or companies outside abroad. So that would be the easiest way to uh, try to connect these and it's not that difficult. We are doing this in, in many institutes around the world. So I think it would be best. But you also have to have some synergy, maybe promote some workshops from Brazilian and, and, uh, and Canadian researchers so they can know a bit more. Uh, I think that would be the best way to start it for those who are not yet collaborating. Excellent. So we are open for that for sure here in Brazil Canada Chamber of Commerce can connect all of you. I'm so glad that Leonardo is here, Monica, Felipe. Uh, it was a very great broad view for us to understand more about the nanotechnology ecosystem. Thank you so much for being in Brazil and joining us here in Canada. We are going to open for a breakfast time, uh, break time, a <laughs> <Not> breakfast, <laughs> afternoon break. But um, I'm very glad you were here, and, and thank you so much, Monica. I know you are in a congress now, so thank you for your time and Felipe. Okay, so 15 minutes of break, not breakfast. <laughs> 15 minutes of break, and then we come back with the startups ecosystem. Oh, thank you. Yes, we can hear you. So we are going to put you online now. Yes, you are already on the screen. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm so happy to count on you and uh, listen to all the innovation things you have been doing. So thank you for joining. No, thank you for that introduction. And it's great to be here. And I uh, would have been here uh, for the whole meeting, uh, but for other obligations uh, today with the federal government here in, in Ottawa. Um, I wanted to you know, speak to you as president of one of the federal granting agencies, but also as the co-chair of the Canada Brazil Joint Committee on Science, Technology and Innovation. So I, I won't speak too long and I'll try and guide you uh, to the right uh, websites and things, even though we may have to come back and distribute those later because there's actually a lot uh, going on. I know also we were trying to get uh, someone to talk about the uh, uh, Canada International Innovation Program. Uh, which has been strongly linked to the JSTCC um, or to that JS, uh, joint, the Canada and Brazil Joint Committee on STNI. Um, but uh, it looks like technical difficulties will prevent that. So I'll come back and talk about that uh, a little bit maybe at the end. 
but uh, maybe pick up uh, where Monica had, had mentioned uh, possibilities for research funding, particularly to assist mobility. And I'm just going to assume here that these things all link to industry and all link to uh, commercial uh, collaboration uh, as opposed to uh, fundamental research or research collaboration. No, I'm happy to talk about that. So the, 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 probably the strongest program in Brazil and, and the one uh, that you'll be aware of, uh, but which unfortunately only supports uh, research and industry uh, in the state of Sao Paulo is FAPASPI, and, and certainly that's worth following up on, as Monica has suggested. In, in Canada, there are also a number of parallel uh, organizations which are federal, so they would support activity across Canada for researchers, uh, some for mobility, uh, and some for projects which would uh, or potentially could lead to uh, covering the cost for students or research associates uh, or for travel um, for collaborators and, and can link to industry. In fact, in some cases, they, they need to link to industry. So uh, the first one I want to mention is MyTax, which you may know about, uh, which is funded by the federal government but operates independently out of uh, Vancouver. And they have for many years operated programming to bring uh, students uh, from Brazil who have academic and business partners uh, in Canada and in Brazil uh, to, uh, to do work there. And uh, it is just my tax CA and definitely worth uh, looking at that and talking to some of the folks there about how that could support uh, Brazilians uh, coming to Canada to work on Brazilian students particularly, but not exclusively. Um, they could be postdocs, as I understand it, also. Um, and uh, these programs are, are highly effective, also for, for sending uh, Canadian students and postdocs to Brazil. Uh, so that's been a very successful uh, program. The agencies, um, and, and I, I'm the president of one, they, they focus on disciplinary areas. So ours is social science and uh, humanities, but it also includes business. Uh, and economics and, and, uh, and innovation. And then the two others, uh, one is for science and engineering and the other is for health. Um, some of them have specific programs that support collaboration with industry. So one, uh, for example, the Natural Science and Engineering Research Council has a program that supports collaboration with industry and with academia. It can include uh, uh, collaboration uh, with, uh, with researchers in other countries, but there are some limitations on that yet. Yeah, I know they're, they're working on developing a version of their alliance program, which spe specifically supports research with industry, uh, so that uh, foreign companies uh, uh, that are resident outside Canada can uh, participate with uh, researchers. For sure, Brazilian companies that have operations in Canada are eligible uh, to participate with their Canadian primary um, uh, applicants. So, I mean, and that would include Bali, it would include Botoenchi, it would include uh, uh, a number of other uh, companies that operate uh, in Canada. So that, that door is already open. Some programs, uh, in, for example, my agency, which is the Social Science and Humanities, run as small as $25,000 Canadian, but they go all the way up to the two and a half million dollars. And we've already had several in Brazil, uh, mostly on social science projects, but they are open to industry uh, as well, which must, must be active partners. So that's the partnership program. The, the other one I wanted to mention is a program that's run by the three agencies. It's called the New Frontiers in Research Fund. And it's just, if you put in your computer and FRF or New Frontiers and Research Fund, it will take you to the site. There are smaller grants uh, and there are very large grants, but they all allow international co-applicants. So you can have an applicant from Brazil and an applicant from Canada and company participation in those grants as well. They can be uh, applied, um, uh, absolutely. And uh, they tend to be or focus on uh, projects that are international in scope through new frontiers in research, but particularly high risk projects uh, or ones that uh, are, are likely to involve more risk than, than other types of projects. Um, and that's, that's also worth 
uh, certainly exploring uh, as a way to, uh, to start. We also work as agencies and CERC. Uh, the Natural Science and Engineering Research Council works in partnership with FASP um, in the same way that the social sciences, my agency, Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council also works with FAPESB on a number of international uh, programs. So in, in these cases, the best thing for you to do if you're interested is to send me an email, uh, ted.hewitt, I'll put it in the, in, the, in the chat in a minute, but ted.hewitt at shirt-crsh.gc.ca uh, uh, and just ask me and I will direct you to wherever uh, you need to go. The last two things, the CIIP program was developed especially to promote academic industry cooperation between Brazil and Canada. So it funds industry in Canada, industry in Brazil, academic collaborators in Brazil and Canada. It's small, a few million dollars a year. It's also been a bit slow uh, to get off the, off the ground. Uh, and you'll be hearing more information about that uh, through the work of the uh, joint STI uh, committee. And on that last note, the, the joint, uh, the Canada-Brazil Joint Science, Technology, and Innovation Committee, which was set up by the two countries uh, over 10 years ago uh, to promote uh, exchange in science and, uh, and uh, innovation, is meeting uh, again uh, in Brasilia in the spring. And its primary role is to explore opportunities for collaboration and also to remove barriers uh, and to make connections. And it involves a broad range of players in the Brazilian government, the Canadian government, many Canadian universities, my tax, all the funding agencies. And basically, we look at, as, as Marcelo can tell you, he's attended several of these. Uh, we look to find ways to enhance uh, activity. So we were instrumental, for example, in lobbying uh, the Canadian government to remove its uh, visa restrictions or its visa requirements for Brazilians to come to Canada. Although Brazil certainly uh, made, that, made, made that first move, but Canada had already relaxed its, its requirements before that. Um, we made connections between institutions, uh, between funding agencies, uh, in a broad way to try and promote uh, that kind of activity. The CIIP, the uh, Canada International Innovation Program that I talked about, uh, it also uh, it, it reports back through that uh, Canada Brazil Joint STNI Committee. So, there's lots of things going on. We have lots of connections to make. If there are particular opportunities, we try to, to work on a thematic basis through the uh, Joint Science Technology Innovation Committee. So we've been talking a lot about artificial intelligence uh, and we've been talking a lot about environments and other areas. This will change. Uh, the topics will change now that the government has changed in Brazil. We anticipate they may have broader topics of interest that the previous government was not that interested in. Uh, so we'll see. Uh, we expect much closer relations between the two governments because ideologically now they're much more aligned than they were um, uh, previously for reasons that you all know. So I think this next meeting will be important. I'll, I'll put my address in the chat if you have ideas for, for things we should be discussing at the next uh, joint committee. Please let me know. We also occasionally will invite presenters to come and talk about things they're doing. So. And, and the chamber is absolutely critical on this. So startup activities, uh, collaborative research, uh, industry engagement, uh, we want to hear all about that. Uh, so we'll be coming back to the chamber uh, for advice on what they would like to present. So I'm going to stop there. Uh, you can write to me in English or Portuguese. Um, that's just absolutely fine. And uh, I'll get back to you uh, immediately. So I'll put my address now in the chat. And thank you for giving me these, these few minutes to, uh, to present. Ted, thank you so much. We have been uh, listening to some of the speakers today uh, from Brazil and from Waterloo, and we see how we can collaborate together and really bring more innovation and sustainability with the two countries working together and listening to you. We can see how many possibilities we have to really uh, improve research, uh, discover new kinds of funding and opportunities to invest in this project. And uh, as an entrepreneur, I can tell you, sometimes we don't know the journey, we don't know the path. So uh, listen to you, yeah. we see that there are many possibilities. We just have to find a way to discover and connect the right That's people, cool. right? So um, of yeah. course, I think the chamber is crucial for that. And thank you for putting your contact uh, as a, 
as the main leader to, to connect all of, all of the group that is here and listening to us. I will try yeah. to open the chat here so everyone can if, see if you right there. See it. Uh, they can just reach out to me if you can't see it. Just yeah, reach out to me they, can, they can for sure reach out to us later and uh, we will be happy to. Oh, it's here, ted.hewitt at cchrc. Oh my god, it's quite difficult, but <laughs> you, are, you, have, you have a password. You don't have, a, you don't have an email, you have a password. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's great. No, but it's great. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining sure. us. Thank you for your time. And if you have a few minutes, listen to these outstanding yeah. entrepreneurs that are will be joining us for the startup panel. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. very special guest, Miriam Lozarty. Miriam Lozarty, I'm very proud of you because you are a newcomer, you cannot a newcomer, you are here for a long time, but a woman leader that made such an incredible uh, journey with the Latin Americans and you guided so many great stories here in a few years course already. And recently I know you received a uh, a very important uh, fund from the government to expand. So I'm, I'm really thrilled to have you. Thank you so much for joining us. I know I have 10 minutes, so good dia, uh, good afternoon. Um, yeah. Uh, so thank you so much for inviting me here today uh, to talk about startups. Um, it's an honor to be here. Uh, you know, I've been always very close with uh, B BCCC, and uh, we have been uh, working together for a while. I mean, uh, it has been a relationship for a while. Um, so, what I have to bring today, and I think the topic today was about startups and what type of programs we have. So, I wanted to start with first, uh, you know, a short agenda about the, our impact, who we are, you know, what we do. Um, uh, what is the Startup Visa program, which is something that normally people are looking for when they are coming to us, corporate program and NIA program. Uh, now, I wanted to start with impact. I'm sorry I'm a walker normally, like I don't like to be behind this. Um, we have had so far 150 startups, uh, a little bit more than that over the past, uh, you know, uh, six years. Uh, normally people, uh, or some people have asked me in the past, why 150 or why no more? Because we don't work with companies in ideation. We work with companies that already have some kind of traction, some kind of sales. Uh, we have, yes, we have two unicorns, and one of them is a Brazilian unicorn. And I wanted to speak about that because CloudWalk is, is, is a very proud part of our, our portfolio company. For you guys to know, uh, they came to us previous uh, Series B. They raised the largest Series B in Brazil. Uh, you know, I think it was $160 million at the time. Uh, they become unicorn in 2021 uh, after they finish our phase two program. And then uh, they, right now, just a few days ago, it was a news, uh, which is, I think, unprecedented in the market they are now authorized by the Central Bank of Brazil to be the first cryptocurrency company to be a part of the uh, Central Bank of Brazil. So they are now uh, you know, having 300,000 businesses, uh, you know, helping 3,000 businesses through CloudWalk, um, and uh, in 5,000 cities, uh, so in Brazil. Just, that's just the number in Brazil, and they are also growing very, very fast in Latin America. They, are, uh, they do installment payments, but they do either way traditional or crypto, uh, which for the ones that are here and probably uh, in, in technology, you know, Web3 is the next kind of way, way for what is coming up. And our other unicorn is from Uruguay. Uh, he, um, Diego actually passed through our three phases, you know, phase one, phase two, and instead of phase three, when he became unicorn also in 2021. 
Um, I think his valuation right now is around two billion dollars. Same as Cloudwalk is at a, around two billion point one, uh, you know, um, dollars. Uh, Twenty percent of our co-founders are women. Uh, Forty uh, companies are right now in the acceleration programs. So it's it's really exciting to see the number of companies that we have. We don't have just Latin American companies right now, so for this reason, you probably are going to see a different brand next year. Uh, but uh, uh, we recently also, uh, because of the growth of the community, we have been able to receive some funding from the government, $3.2 million to help startups that are coming into the acceleration programs that I'm going to speak right now here. Uh, so. Uh, starting from, uh, you know, who we are, uh, you know, we are incorpor incorporated as a nonprofit organization. Again, it was 2016, but we actually received the first group of startups in 2017. Between them, uh, nine companies, eight of them from Brazil. <laughs> so we have pretty much Portuguese kind of, like, uh, you know, a community in that first year. Uh, we are supported by the city of Toronto. We are also supported by uh, IRAP and uh, the federal government through FEDEF. Uh, we are members of the National Angel Capital Organization and we are designated the first Latin American company and first newcomer company designated under uh, the Sera Visa program from the federal government. Uh, this is our team, by the way, I brought them all. <laughs> so they are here. So if you want to talk with them about Sera Visa, our phase one, phase two corporate program, you know they are here. Uh, so you will see them in between the audience. Uh, this is our amazing board of directors. Uh, you know, uh, between them, I want just to highlight the participation of Valerie Fox, who is the person who created DMC Ryerson and was the person who brought DMC Ryerson to number one business incubator in the world. And certainly she has been great for the advice. As well, Rafael Pinto, uh, he's Brazilian. Uh, he has been working with, uh, you know, diplomatic links for a while. So he is the one who's representing us in Latin America when we have, you know, different type of events there. Uh, Peter Alkins and Marco Strayer are both investors. Catherine Rose has been working here with different type of accelerators and incubators for the last 20, 25 years. And Michael Kennedy works with CIPC in the investment portfolio. Uh, so, we have different programs right now. Uh, the most popular one, of course, is the Sara Visa program. Uh, I, will, I will tell you so far the challenges and also the opportunities with that program. I want to also be very transparent with people on how that program works. And, uh, of course, we have some other programs. Um, one, one interesting thing is that we started to work the Sara Visa program and then uh, the government of Canada through IRA came to us and they said, well, you're already working with international startups, giving that support for the Visa program. Why not to create a program for the ones that are already here, for the newcomers that already own a company, a technology company? So that's why we have the Newcomer Entrepreneur Accelerator Program. And uh, uh, we also have the opportunity to imitate the Sera Visa program through corporate program. And this is a program that that is more for uh, people don't, that don't require to um, immigrate to Canada. So for example, one of your sponsors here is Bali. Uh, one company in the corporate program actually uh, closed a deal with Bali in 2020, end of the 2020, to start a pilot with them. The uh, uh, co-founder of uh, this company that I'm talking about, uh, he didn't want to immigrate to Canada. He just wanted to have an office here. He wanted to bring talent to, uh, to Canada and of course start working some pilots. So there you go, like we can actually work pilots uh, you know, through our um, startups in the different programs. Um, this is a startup visa program. So you will find this information in the website, exactly the same information, so you don't have to <laughs> You know, take a look of the small text here. The most important part for uh, for us, for you, to, uh, for you to know, is that we work with technology companies already with certain amount of revenue. Uh, if they don't have revenue, then if they are, uh, you know, in um, a MVP mode, you know, especially when they are in like health tech, clean tech, um, you know, those type of technologies that have a long commercialization cycle, so MVP is okay. But the others, any software, you know, any other te technology that can be commercialized a little bit faster, then uh, certainly we want to see some revenue. We want to see intellectual property. 
uh, in Latin America, I find out that's really difficult. So I was really excited to hear the information about the nanotechnology and all that you guys were bringing here because uh, really patents is, is something that uh, startups struggle with. Uh, sometimes they have something to claim, but they haven't claimed patent. If they have something to claim, they still can bring to, to the program. And uh, of course, uh, you know, they have to have some English proficiency and some, some financial stability because Toronto, Canada is very expensive. <laughs> so they, they have to survive for the first year at least, uh, you know, without customers. Um, so how the government of Canada made a difference for this program was that we were able to actually structure the program in the past. We were just having conversations with startups, you know, seeing how they can progress in the market, kind of giving whatever we have in the market for them. But with the funding, we actually put in more um, mentors. We are putting a safe fraction executive, uh, which is very important for the company. Sometimes they don't have a CFO and CMO, you know, and this program actually is giving that, that particular part. And it has been really good because safe fractions are also very expensive. Uh, in the market, so the government of Canada is now funding that part. Startups don't come to uh, startup visa program immediately, so we don't have a direct applications for a startup visa program. All of them have to pass through phase one and phase two, uh, and then you know for those that are here or they want to maybe uh, start exploring uh, you know a path to a startup visa program, please talk with Marcel. Uh, for those that are. Uh, uh, want to perhaps be a part of the uh, corporate program or newcomer program, or even start a visa program, they want to have a, a little bit more information, Meg is here, uh, so she can give more information about those programs. Again, corporate program imitates a start a visa program. It's a little bit more customized. Oops, that tells me that I go to the 10 minutes. <laughs> it's a little bit more customized. And, uh, uh, but it's, it's exactly the same program uh, as a set of visa program in, in the way that we have the same number of mentors, see fractional, and you know, the same resources. Now, uh, the newcomer accelerator program for this program, the criteria is that the startups need to be, uh, they, they need to have the co-founders be uh, have PR or new citizens in Canada. Um, we don't care about the time that you have been in Canada, but you know, claim uh, you are a new citizen, new permanent resident. And we care about um, that it's a technology company also with intellectual property uh, to claim. So uh, here is some information about you know, uh, our program coordinator for these programs and you know, our corporate partners. We work very close also with other uh, corporations in the market, so you can see here. And um, thank you so much. So that that's the information. Thank you so much, Miriam. Uh, after we will have a short panel, so we can uh, ask a few questions for you. Thank you very much. So for now, uh, we are gonna have Daniela Carolina Ecker. Daniela is in Brazil. Uh, she's the leader of new business development at Puki the biggest uh, uh, and actually the largest private university in Brazil. It's Pontificia Universidade Católica do Rio Grande do Sul. Um, Daniela, can you hear us? Not yet? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes, Daniela, we can hear you. I will put you on the stream. Just give me a minute. Okay. Aha, we can see you. Yes, so nice to see okay. you, Daniela. Nice to see you. Yes. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we are with I'm an just audience. I'm just see the audience. Yes, that's true. I will try to put my computer, then you can see. No problem, no problem. <laughs> but you have an audience, very qualified okay. audience here today. So you can start. Well, I bet that. Um, well, uh, thank you and hello to everyone. I'm gonna try to be very quick because I know um, first I, I thought that I had 30 minutes, but actually I don't. I have like eight minutes, so I have to be really uh, just that. But uh, I can tell you yeah. something. If you want to share your presentation uh -huh. with the audience, we created a QR code, uh, and okay. everyone yes. can see uh, the whole presentation and more information about technical data. Yeah, I'm going to go very quickly through the slides. 
sorry, I just uh, let me put in the beginning. Just of course, a second. Of course. Um, okay, so I'm from Technopool, and as um, mentioned already, uh, we are at uh, Cook University here in Rio Grande do Sul. We have more than 70 years of experience. Actually, next year is going to be 75 years of um, Cook University here and 20 years of Technopook. Um, Technopook is one of the largest parts here in Brazil. Um, we have inside Technopook several uh, labs um, along with the company, so it's uh, a, a very diverse um, uh, environment. So we have big companies, we have startups, we have lots of labs uh, and research institutes here at Technopook. Uh, of course, one of them is uh, a nanotechnology uh, research center. It's focused mainly in attending to projects with industry and they um, they work mainly with ultra thin surface coatings. Um, and we have a program here, a big part of our program here is the Technopook startups. So we have a whole full dedicated team to work with the startups here in our park. Today we have um, more than 130 startups with us. Uh, just only here at the park in all of the various phases, the uh, ideation, the ones that are still doing their MVP and the ones that are in the market already. But to talk about a little bit startups as general, I brought here some numbers and uh, this is very um, tricky because we have lots of uh, researches about uh, how many sectors we have in Brazil and what are the numbers and what are the sectors and we have many institutions that does this so you will find lots of different numbers but I chose the uh, Brazilian Association of Startups that has this and I'm gonna sh uh, share with all of you all this information so you can go through and, and look for yourself and go into the site that is the startup base. So basically, it says that we have more than 10,000 startups in Brazil, and we have like uh, more than 70 com com communities of startups. And I'm gonna just leave the, the, the presentation here to show you the sites, okay? So you have, for example, um, this information here, okay, of all the startups, and you can uh, look for startups by state, by city, uh, by, by the phase that they are, like for example, they are um, in operation, they are in traction, they are in ideation, uh, and we have the communities that I told you, you can look for the communities as well, because we have here a very strong community in the south of Brazil, but we have in the north of Brazil, like Gurupi, uh, the ABC Valley in Sao Paulo, the Acai Valley uh, in Belém, and you name it. There's everything you can find about these communities of startups, these small ecosystems in the region, you can find it here. And they, Usually they are all something valid. <laughs> so um, this is another tool you can use. Let me just see here, just a second. Uh, and uh, here we have, let me go back to the presentation. Um, we have the ecosystem in Rio Grande do Sul that you can also hear, I'm narrowing it. I started with Brazil, and now uh, I'm here in Rio Grande do Sul, and in Rio Grande do Sul, one of the ecosystems here that is called Caldeira, he conducted this study uh, to map all the startups that are in Rio Grande do Sul. 
and I just copy and paste all of the, the partners that they had uh, to do this study. Uh, and this study shows that here in Rio Grande do Sul alone, we have uh, six, uh, 661 startups. And you can find this uh, going through uh, their website, and I'm going to show you, I'm going to uh, share the links with you, so you can do it yourself, and you can find here uh, by sector what they do is if it's focused on B2C, B2B, B2G, uh, where are the startups, how many employees they have, so it's a very nice data for you for you to, to have a look, um, very nice tool. Excellent. Uh, and and um, so we have lots of um, information about the startups here in Brazil, and it's very easy for you to, to get into these tools and to, to find what you are interested in. So I'll be back, go back, to, uh, I have a lot of things to show you, but we don't have time. So let me go back to the presentation here. Huh? Okay. Um, okay. So, um, for example, here in Rio Grande do Sul, we have startups in the agriculture sector, we have uh, in the industry, cyber security, communication, green tech, biotech, uh, ed tech. So we map all the startups that we have here in Rio Grande do Sul. And in the presentation, I have all the links. You can actually get in touch with all of these startups by going through the material. Um, it's a lot of things. And here I come to where we, as TechnoCookie, can help and make these connections. Uh, the TechnoCook uh, Techno has a program now called TechnoCook Anywhere. So this is us spreading our wings to the world. And we want to take our uh, startups with us. And we want to bring the startups from uh, everywhere to um, to here to TechnoCook as a tool, as a place where the startups can start um, working with the Brazilian market. So we have here programs for startups that go uh, from the ideation uh, to to the the. The, the, the startup that wants to go to the market and then needs investment uh, and we have uh, problems for each phase of the startup connecting with partners that are important for them in each of those phases. Uh, so if they are doing a, um, a product, we have here left to prototype to do the, um, their research about the product. Um, and we have, if they are already in the market, but they need investment, we have a whole set of programs that uh, prepare the startup for receiving this investment and put the startup in contact with investors here uh, in Brazil. Uh, we work uh, with uh, different hubs here at Technopulki because as large as we are, we don't have in our team all the expertise that we need to give this um, good mentoring and these good connections for our startups. So, for example, we have like a team of 40 people working here in uh, TechnoCookie. We can have in this team expertise in the market of uh, the health sector, the um, uh, uh, artificial intelligence sector, the uh, agribusiness sector. So what we do, we bring partners from outside that have the dispatches, that have these connections, that know the, the investors that are interested in this kind of technologies or startups, and we bring them as a partner to be here with us at TechnoCook. 
So we uh, find hubs uh, in different sectors with partners that um, we bring from the market. Uh, so, for example, for the uh, artificial intelligence hub, we have a partner called uh, Wise Idea that is an accelerator specialized in artificial intelligence. Um, we have the Health Plus Innovation Center, and our partners for the Health Plus Innovation Center is a hospital uh, and is another accelerator that is specialized in this business of health techs. Daniela, let me ask you something. Um, you said that Technopook is everywhere, anywhere, right? Yeah. So, for example, <laughs> if, a, if a startup that is in Canada or a accelerator that is in Canada, how they can join Technopook? Well, I'm getting there. Okay, because um, I just want to wrap up because I want to go, I want to yeah. have a few minutes for us to ask okay. a, quiz, a few questions. Uh, so, we, we give all this um, uh, um, support for the startups. Uh, they are all connected through a platform, so it doesn't matter if they are outside Brazil and Brazil, United States and Canada, they are all connected through the same platform. Um, we give uh, many benefits for the startups, including, for example, staying with us for a period with no problems. Uh, so the startup can actually come to Brazil and stay a minimum of three months and we can work on that. They can stay here to make all of these connections uh, and have Technobook as their home without having to pay anything. Wow. And, we, and we engage them uh, in all of our uh, programs to develop startups even if they are not here. So they can participate in all of the, our programs uh, virtually. So that is Technobook Startups. We already have startups from United States, Europe that are participating in our programs virtually. That's so a that's, great opportunity. Yeah. I, I and we have, uh, we have a few companies that uh, are at the same time here in Brazil and in Canada. And some, uh, are, uh, some, some of these companies are here. This is our team. And you can contact us at any time. I hope I didn't go too fast, but no. it's a lot of things to show. No, you but are... I make myself available to all of you to any questions. You are very succinct, and thank you for that. You, you, you gave a lot of information in a short period of time. So thank you for joining us, Daniela. Um, <laughs> okay, so now, yes, so we are gonna just go here for a minute. Okay, so Cora is also in Brazil. Uh, Cora Souza is the head of international markets uh, at Sebrae. Uh, she is a uh, a global leader, she has been uh, doing a lot of connections in different countries. Can you hear Cora, us? Can you hear us, Cora? Yes, I can hear you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so can you much. Can you hear me well? Yes, yes, we can hear you well. well. Thank you. Thank you for joining us and congratulations. I saw that you received, uh, the Riper Startups receive a recognition as the largest community in Brazil. So thank you. Thank you for joining us and congratulations. Okay. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Cora Souza. I'm now head of startup international markets at Sebrae for Startups. Uh, feel free to contact me for any questions or me in by email or LinkedIn. This is my QR code to, that directs you to my LinkedIn page. Um, today I'll be speaking a little about the startup ecosystem in Brazil. And to know the importance of it, Brazil is the top Latin American country of best startup ecosystem in terms of investments, ecosystem players, connections, quality, and also quantity of startups. Uh, Brazil also belongs to the top 30 uh, world ranking, although Sao Paulo is in 16th place as best 
activity for startups, and we're still we are still rising. Um, nowadays, Brazil has more than 22,000 startups and 78 uh, formerly known startup communities. That is really important for us. And when we met the profile of these startups, we found out that 52% are in traction or scale stage, and 46% were founded as of 2020. So you see that most of the startups in Brazil are very young. Only 20% have been founded for more than five years, but, but they're still reaching out to, uh, to the traction and scale stage. And talking about the main segments in which we have more startups here, uh, they are education, financial services, and health. But there is also a significant increase in startups related to agriculture, which is a really large market in Brazil as well. And many of you might be asking, OK, but what we're talking about Brazil, why Canadian startups should think about Brazil? Well, the main reason uh, is that Brazil is the largest, seventh largest consumer market in the world with a population of 240 million, five times larger than the population of Canada. So in a large market, market like this, there are always some gaps to the field and many opportunities ahead. And here we have some consumer trends that may be interesting for your businesses, such as e-commerce, uh, new experience, the food market, health and well-being, customized products and services, beauty and cosmetics, and a significant increase in con conscious consumption, sustainable, natural, and sharing solutions as well. And moving to the final question, how can you access the Brazilian market? The best way to do that, to get in the market, to understand the market and the culture, is to uh, go through an incubation or an acceleration program. Uh, and here we have more than six, than 360 incubators in Brazil, such as Nexus, Supera, Cetec, in Porto Chital. Most of, of them are tied to tech parts, and that can open a lot of opportunities to you. And we also have 60 uh, startup accelerators with different features, um, some that supports foreign startups, some with equity-free programs. Uh, you gotta see which one uh, best suits your business and needs. Uh, here we have Shift. Uh, that is, a, there is a program that also um, supports foreign startups. While it is now open, Startup Farm is also one of the best accelerators in Brazil and it is also very known here. So, uh, but I couldn't miss telling you about the best accelerator in Brazil this year, that is the Bad for Startups. We are a private enterprise, but we work on public resources through small business taxes. So all of our programs are free to startups in the state of Sao Paulo, which represents 30% of Brazilian startups and more than 30% of country's economy. And it is important to say that uh, we don't see all of those other incubators and accelerators as competitors, but we actually uh, see them as partners in the ecosystem and we always work together. So two weeks ago, we won this prize uh, at Startup Awards. Um, we are now the best accelerator in Brazil and we are really proud to say that it has been a lot of work, uh, but you may ask, what did we do to earn that prize? And in one and a half year, that's how old we are, just one and a half year, <laughs> we supported more than 2,000 startups and 1,200 scientific researchers. Uh, we have more than 30 brand new programs to support startups in all different development stages um, and all different segments as well. And we count on more than 40 partners um, uh, so we can act in the whole state. We've been acting in more than 150 cities all around the state. Uh, and we have also startups with funding and grants, access to market, 
And to do this, the main acting pillars we've been working on are to help early stage uh, entrepreneurs to start their businesses, model and grow, uh, to increase sales, matching startups to potential clients, to support deep tech projects, and turn them, these researchers into businesses, to ease the way to capital and funding, and to boost specific segments such as fintech, health tech, tech tax, and also to strengthen communities, which is very important to disseminate the culture of startups and knowledge about innovation and technology here. Uh, so if you need help to come to Brazil, count on us and our partners. Some of them are also here today, so hello everyone. <laughs> And to find more about what we're doing, uh, you can enter in our website or reach us on LinkedIn or Instagram. And appreciate F, uh, everyone for being here, your time, your attention. And I'm here uh, to answer some questions at the end. Yes. Cora, it's a pleasure having you here with us. Thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate the invitation. Yes, uh, we are going to have a question, at least one for each one, as soon as we finish here, so please stay online. Um, so now, I would like to invite our uh, in-person, in-person <laughs> uh, speaker, is Richard Feld, from CEO from Conquer. Thank Richard, you. thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Hello everybody, thank you. Thank you so much for, for having me here. Um, I'm Richard, I'm CEO and co-founder of Conquer. We are a mining startup from, from Brazil. Uh, one good thing of being a, a German living in Brazil is that if Germany loses, I can still cheer. <laughs> <laughs> so with this said, um, going back to some uh, more serious matters here, um, we understand ourselves as um, a mining company uh, for safety and security. So what we do is we validate the safety of tailings dams with cosmic rays. Um, this is a bit strong, but I mean, um, I don't want to be pretentious that we could resolve anything, but we might as well have helped or figured out some ways that maybe would not have been so, so strong. So about tailings dams in itself, um, it's a matter that is not uh, resolved yet. So you see that um, the, the, expectation, the expectations or the, the, the previews here is that there will be more tailing stamps failure very likely. So that's not good news. There are worldwide 687 um, dams that are today <coughs> considered as high risk dams. And that's then too much um, if I may be to say that. So, um, where are they? Um, they are uh, located here specifically in Brazil, Canada, and Australia. Um, you see, all these are, are, are dams that are uh, in these places. There are active dams and not active dams, and the green ones are the ones high risk of high risk. So, the ones that are dark green are high risk still in production, and the ones that are light green are high risk. Um, and they are not in production anymore, which does not mean that they will not break. We had just one a couple of months ago in Africa. Um, okay, so this is the, the scenario that we are trying to be productive and passionate and helpful with. Um, how do we get there? How, who is Conquer and how do we work and how we function? And how did we get to that technology? Um, there was a challenge launched by Anglo American from mining up two years ago, two and a half years ago, about measuring um, the ore piles in real time 24 7. And we, as Conquer, we won that um, challenge and we solved that challenge with a telescope that uses cosmic rays, muons. And I will just in a second talk about what that is. Um, so we built a telescope, it's autonomous, self calibrating. It works with artificial intelligence and has machine learning involved because after the telescope, we also do the 3D mapping of the situation. And we use our own uh, IoT open source gateway, uh, open source platform, sorry, um, which also is being used by, by Embrapa, which has been talked about before from 
on him. So this is the telescope. Um, what on Earth are moons? So moons, they come on Earth actually, so they are, they come from space, they are cosmic rays, and they penetrate, they penetrate um, pretty much everything, and um, through the penetration, afterwards capturing them, we can see what they went through, and we can measure specificities of where they came through and what they came through. So we can do like a moon, it's known as moon tomography or moography, um, which is like a reverse X-ray. In X-ray, you throw out particles, and here you receive particles. So it's um, uh, it's uh, very energy efficient, and it's free actually. They are all around the moon. Just capture, just <laughs> capture them, and understand where they went through, and uh, do the three D mapping with that. So with that, just as us with that, we are. Um, Talking a little bit about what we understand each other as conquer, what we want to be. So we we want to work with with the powers of nature to solve human problems. Uh, and in this case, um, we make the hidden visible. You don't need to dig, you don't need to drill, you don't need to probe. It's all there by capturing the moon, the cosmic rays, the moons. And so capturing them, um, we measure, as I said already, what matters and the matter that matters. So what is it that we measure? We measure density, humidity, weight, volume, geometry, geometry and purity of, and there we go, dams, ore piles, pits, and other objects that stand still, or almost still. They can move a little bit, but they don't, they wobble around too much, then we have a hard time. So about the tailing stems, we can measure the safety and predictability of them by um, the density. So what we do is we put telescopes on the bottom of the dams, and with that we can make a, a 3D um, reconstruction of uh, the dam. And depending on the number of telescopes, um, we are we have a better or a, a clearer picture, and depends on depends on also on the structure of of how the dams are being built and how the geological conditions are. We have results pretty pretty fast actually. So what can these telescopes be be applied to? They can measure ore piles. They can measure the sedimentation in mining pits, which we do also, we have a project at some article with that. Um, they can measure um, the density within thickeners, and they can measure the the the, um, the tailing stems, as I've said. So these are these are just some applicabilities from from the mining sector that we are working as, with. So us as a, as a as a startup, we have Anglo American and San Marco as scale uppers, so they. We have contracts with both of these companies, so um, this is what we do in Brazil. So now, coming to Canada, so Conquer goes to Canada, right? Right. So the first thing is, go. Um, I, I went to PDAC 2022, then I went to Collision, then after five months I managed to get a, a, an article being published, and there I was, right? No, no. It's much more, much harder than that to, to, to get into the, the, the to get to be alive in any ecosystem. So what were the first steps? As I said, first was PDAG. So PDAG, I met PCCC, I met Mary, then Adriana, then Peter. Then I went to the Northern Ireland. I, uh, I, I talked to Anthony, who pointed me to Tamer at the Canadian Mining Journal, who said, yes, I want to publish an article with you. And it took five months for this article to come out. Then I went to Collision, and I met Charles. Charles is here today, thank you very much, Charles. Charles from my guys right there, Mining Innovation Accelerator. Then I went to the government of, of Canada, talked to Marcelo, who pointed me to Monica, who pointed me to Tassiani. <laughs> and then I went to the Alberta IoT, who talked to Brenda, because our, our platform runs on IoT as well. So these are the people that I, in my first kind of approach, approached. So I managed to incorporate um, Concrete Canada. Fantastic. And there we go, the Death Valley. <laughs> it's not so easy. So what I need is customers, first of all. The Death Valley, as we were heard, we heard before, is um, where startups die. So we don't want to die, we want to save lives. So we have first we go to customers, then we try associations, which is exactly this platform right here. Um, and consultancies. 
to see if our solution can work with consultancies and consultancies can use our solution to deliver their work. Look for advisors for grants, see if I can get any kind of grant, and last but not least, to find investors to see who can invest in Concord to see the value in that. So what are the challenges? Digital marketing is always, is always the biggest challenge in anything. Um, taxes and incentives, as we heard before, it's not so trivial. It's um, something you have to find somebody that can help you with. Uh, physical presence, I put here some phrase in, in Portuguese, which I think 89% of the people here will understand, which is, if you're not close, things won't happen. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, customer success, so the, the, the stuff that we manage to deliver, the customer has to be happy, has to see value, and has to continue wanting uh, to work with us. Part of the competitors, there are competitors out in, 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 in the Canadian market already, so there are other companies working with Moons. Um, I'd like to see them as partners, so that's why I put it in this little ambiguity here. Word of mouth and networking is, is crucial to everything, and the proximity with entities like institutions and organizations I don't see as that much of a challenge, it's something you have to do, and I'm doing it right here with you guys, thank you very much. Um, so the next steps, what, what we want with Conquer is um, we want to deliver the first telescope to Canada, we want to deserve a grant, because uh, uh, don't take grants for granted. It's, it's nice, it's good, uh, it's maybe not so hard to get one, but it's not so easy to get one either. It's not trivial, it's not like you get, the, get your cash and go, you know, we have to go through the process, deliver on, 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 on all the stuff that you are writing down to deliver to. Virtual goes real is um, presence in Canada, physical presence here with physical people, and not just me coming by every couple of months. Um, and expanding the market to help in making the tailings safer, uh, the mining more efficient and reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions in the end. Who are we? We are a team of widely non-diverse people, all white and male, but uh, we hope to work on that. So um, many people come from Unicampi as well, so all our PhDs are from, from Unicampi, which we were talking with Monica before. Um, so um, it is a little bit about my passions, who I am, what I, what I like to do. Um, this is the article that I uh, that we managed to get published in October 3rd, like two months ago. And um, that was what I wanted to share with you guys. Thank you very much. Sometimes we get more time when we come to the international market or the uh, Canadian market than other entrepreneurs because we don't follow some of the suggestions regarding board of advice and funding. <laughs> so I want to ask you, um, how do you think we can collaborate thinking about the Canadian Chamber of Commerce and all this group that is here together to guide these companies to find a board of advisors and also look for funding? What are the gaps and how do you think we can help them to yeah. go to that? Thank you, Raquel. Uh, no, I want to clarify, this is not with Brazilians, just <laughs> this is every emerging market country that it comes here in general. Uh, and yeah, this is the first thing that, that I uh, deal with and I think all my team deal with is that the lack of advisors uh, an advi advisory board for the companies because they need locals to advise them. 
Uh, I was thinking also that the Chamber of Commerce is a great opportunity. You guys have different types of companies here where companies like him, uh, you know, they can probably get pilot projects mm -hmm. inside. So I think that the Chamber of Commerce can create a good environment for pilot projects to start. Uh, I think most of the companies that are coming, they require a first opportunity to show what they have, you know, because you have one. I, like, yeah. I, <laughs> yeah, it was the same thing. And I think after that, you know, they can have how, uh, somehow prove the market, get validation, and of course, uh, you know, I feel like uh, many times um, startups coming from emerging markets, they are really like, it's, it's a very lonely journey for them. And I'm not saying that here in Canada is not, but people tend to uh, get help or uh, request the advice of somebody else and, get, and create a board of directors with, which for us has been the impossible mission <laughs> with the startups that we have. I don't know why they are so rejecting to, to get board of directors, but I think that's important. It's important in the market that you get a board of directors, people that other people can identify as, a, you know, somehow a leader in the market. So it brings you kind of like a, a short way to customers. You know, customers may not know you, but they may somebody in your board. And that's uh, how we want to work. So yeah, it's so, like people that want to be advisor or, you know, companies that can perhaps facilitate pilots for companies will be great. So that's a great opportunity for the audience to be aware yeah. that there are these opportunities <laughs> and you can help the Brazilian and the Latin American and, uh, immigrants to really uh, overcome this challenge. For sure. Okay. Yeah. And now a question for you um, regarding uh, uh, your mindset. Because you said you are German, mm. but you live in, in Brazil, you are expanding to Canada. So you have already a global mindset, yes, right? Yes, totally. So my, so my question is, uh, how do you, do you feel like your company is going to expand and what is the biggest challenge to expand globally? I know you are starting here from Canada, but what would be the biggest challenge? The biggest challenge to expand is to stay alive, basically. Mm -hmm. um, so um, what my strategy was is to, to grow muscle, to, to grow Brazilian muscle, even though it's not the strongest of currencies, but at least it's, it's something that keeps me alive. And with that, go expanding to the closest, the most organic way of growth. So Canada is a very nice ecosystem, it's very, and it's very close to me as well. I, I used to live here when I was younger, so I, I know a little bit how this used to work a long time ago, but still how it works. From that, going to Australia, going to South Africa, going to these other places where I know that there is the demand. But first of all, it's, 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 it's the value of that. It's really scary. I mean, it's 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 something that we have to we have to be continue being ourselves and stay alive. So that's 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 really important. So get get the traction in Brazil, which is coming, expanding to Canada, not making any step or anything like they say in Brazil, a step that's bigger than your feet. No, don't 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 do anything that you will regret afterwards. But be bold enough and wise enough how bold you will be. So <laughs> that's pretty much the, the, the tricky part. But, but going organically towards the markets that, that are there, which is Canada, Australia, and South Africa. Excellent. And you mentioned something that I really like it about the networking and the, mm -hmm. all the connections yeah. that Canada is bringing to you. Because the Canadians do that. We, we, we open doors, yes, we totally. give 15 minutes to talk and, and uh, uh, listen to you and one suggests another person and then you go from there. Yeah. So my question is for Cora regarding this. So Cora, you mentioned that uh, in one year and a half, Sebrae uh, for Startup uh, really grew like exponentially um, and became the best and the biggest uh, uh, accelerator in Brazil. And most of that regarding collaboration, right? So my question is regarding that. Um, how do you think we can collaborate, bringing more Brazilians and Canadians together to expand the mindset, like Richard mentioned, like um, to really think globally and be able to expand more business to Canada or bring more Canadian business to Brazil? <coughs> Okay, yeah, exactly. So I think that Canadian interpreters are more advanced and experienced uh, in the global mindset 
of doing business. Brazilian entrepreneurs, um, most of them still think that Brazilian market is enough, but it's not going to be enough when a uh, large company comes here and get all the market share. So here we still have a uh, great work to do to make the entrepreneurs more conscious about the need to go abroad, the need to go global, and all the opportunities in Canada. And I think that for the Canadian entrepreneur, uh, we still have a work to do um, to make them see all the opportunities we have here in Brazil. Because in a large company, in a large country like this, uh, there's space to more 20,000 startups, you know, uh, that are many solutions, uh, many problems that, are, that still need new solutions. Um, and in regards of collaborating, uh, we actually, we work with many companies and sometimes we pay uh, accelerators and specialists so they, so they can provide the, speci the specialist um, consulting and mentoring to the startups that need them. Uh, that's how we, we could do all these mentoring sessions, all this consulting and supporting all those uh, 2,000 startups here. And we expect to do the same. So we, what we intend to do is find more uh, partners in Canada and other uh, international markets so they can help us uh, doing this bridge with knowledge and preparation, uh, because there's a long uh, there's a long journey to do. You can't just decide to go abroad, just like uh, um, our our invitee said. Uh, you can't just decide to go abroad and uh, get your company there, and you're going to get clients, and it's going to be a success. You need to plan. You need to do a product market fit process, and just assess actually new clients and do all the, the, the business plan to a new market. So we need some partners to help us do that, that with that with the focus on that new market, on that new culture, and that's what we intend to do with Canada too. Excellent, Cora. Thank you so much. I hope we can collaborate even more together with Brazil Canada Chamber of Commerce and all these audience that is here. So just to wrap up, someone has any questions or um, would like to ask? Yes, please. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for all this presentation. Mia, my question is for you and perhaps um, for her as well. Um, we know that like when the businesses are just starting up, like really brand new in the market, don't have clients at all and don't have revenue at all, it's very hard and very difficult for them to grow in the market, right? Because they are unknown, first of all, and they need to build their reputation in terms of like and be able to scale fast. In that sense, do you also offer any specific program for these specific companies that are just like getting alive now, just operating now, or just like being the pillar just now? Or do it, it is a must for them to have a full business plan and financial plan in place with all the projections of revenue and perhaps profitability? How that works? Like, how, how is this for them to get into the program for the startups and do a business together? Yeah, for what is our programs? No, we don't work with aviation companies. We may do that in the in the next you know stages of Adam, but we collaborate very close with other institutions in the market. Like, we are very close to Accelerator Center, to many other of the uh, you know. Um, incubators and accelerators that we have here. So whenever we see a case that is like a just an idea from scratch, you don't need us at that time because then you have to pay and it's kind of like it's different, right? Um, so we can just canalize that to the right institution and we may have three or four, you know, in the list that we can recommend per profile. So yeah, we can do that. Excellent. Anyone else? Yes, please. I have uh, just one comment concerning uh, when you asked how can we bring uh, Canada and Brazil together. And, and like we say in Brazil, I'm going to tell my fish, <laughs> individual fish. But uh, I work for MyTex, uh, like as Tad just said, for my NRC. We do have a lot of programs that a Brazilian company can collaborate with Canadian researchers to do 
research here in Canada. I've been getting more and more Brazilian companies who are interested in expanding to Canada and doing R&D here. So they arrive in the university setting, they have professors that can be part of the board of advisors. So you know we can create this environment uh, with every single Canadian uh, university. We're all over Canada. We also have programs for Canadian university, for Canadian startups who want to go global, travel grants. We have programs for commercialization. Uh, and you have a Brazilian at my text who is uh, developing and trying to really push for collaborations with Latin America. So I just want to talk to everybody. And, and with every single one of you and the panelists here today, but I really think we have some programs that can really glue everything that we spoke today. So just looking forward for to sure, talking. For sure, for sure. Thank you so much. Well, I think it's a really, really nice program. And I have to say, like, I've been having contact with you guys in the past. Uh, <laughs> a comment that I have here, uh, for, for those that have companies or want to have companies, you know, sometimes people get a little bit suspicious with all the help that they get from Canada. Because <laughs> they are like, how come we have all this help? How come we have all this here? Uh, you know, uh, for those that want to bring a company here, like at the end of the day, what the government or either local or, you know, federal government is doing uh, with that help, particular help, is helping you to grow so you can pay taxes and create jobs. There is nothing suspicious we have. So if you see all this help, just take it, okay? <laughs> because it's a good help, especially for people that are in the beginning and they, they, they need to enter into the market. So. And that's why, I, uh, that's how I want to finish. If we can give like a, in one minute, a message for everyone that is listening to us, mm -hmm. uh, a piece of advice for Vicky, Miriam, and then Cora. There's no silver bullet, mm -hmm. don't give up, and don't listen to naysayers. Mm -hmm. Continue, continue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I will say just, uh, you know, uh, same with Richard here, keep up, uh, you know, don't, uh, don't disencourage, and ask for help. Mm. You don't need to do this alone, ask for help. People will help you. Cora, would you like to say a few words? Well, I want to say that it's always a long journey, but you must um, know that the, the sacrifice you do now is going to become some great results, uh, great achievements. So actually don't give up and find all the help that you can. You have um, many entities uh, like BCCC, like Super for Startups and others. Uh, that can help you through this journey to ease the way um, to, to success and enjoy that, that time because all that matters is the journey and then when you achieve something, it's going to be great. Thank you, Cora. And I agree with you. We have our goals, but the journey must be fun. It must be really rewarding with our purpose. And, uh, in the name of uh, Brazil Canada Chamber of Commerce, I thank you for all of, all of you that came here listening to us and sharing all these ideas, especially the speakers from Brazil, from Canada. It was, has been an honor to be with you here and I want to invite all of you to celebrate our annual celebration event hosted by our great partners and um, Peter is here from Milan. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Cora, you're gonna miss a good time. Yeah. <laughs> Next time, Cora, you must be here. <laughs> I don't know. She pretends. She pretends. Oh my God. She's not here. <laughs> I'm glad to be here. Um, so thank you, everyone, and especially for our sponsors again. So Platina Sponsor Valley, our gold sponsor Aerial Copper, EDC, Silver Sponsor. Cisco here, BMA Advogados, Group Hill Blending Mining, TMX, 4B Mining Corp, Network e Social Hours, a Sponsor, Mela Hawk, uh, Logistics, and we have also a special sponsor for our celebration that is Brigadeiros, right? Yeah, yeah so we are going to taste some Brigadeiros today. <laughs> so please join us there, it's going to be a pleasure uh, celebrating and networking with all of you. Thank you. Thank you.